Tuesday morning of February. I took a phone call from my mum to say that my nan had had a fall. My nan was taken to hospital. And a few weeks later, my nan had died. This is a talk about compassion. Not compassion for those like my nan receiving care. I want to talk to you today about compassion for those providing care. The loss of my nan led me to ask the question, who cares for carers? Now the more observant ones you may have noticed, I'm not a woman. <laughs> and when it comes to conversations about care, men are very rarely involved. As a sector, our experience is that care for parents tends to be arranged by the eldest daughter of the family. Men are not good at this stuff. If you've got a brother, just have a think about that. Okay, so I'd like to ask you to stand, please. Now, if you've had to arrange care for a family member, please sit down. For everybody else, you will likely have this to come. This comes to us all, and as a society, we don't talk about this until it becomes absolutely essential. Please sit down. Thank you. So we could see from that that most in the room have yet to have a conversation about care within the family. I'm going to tell you a little bit now about my family's experience. My nan was hugely important in my early life. My dad was largely absent, my mum worked full time, and as a result, me, my brother and my sister were raised in part by my nan. My nan lived with arthritis for 15 years. Towards the end of her life, her arthritis was in her spine. One of the problems with spinal arthritis is that you can get dizziness, lightheadedness, which can lead to an increased chance of falls. And on the advice of a social worker, we were told to get a home care provider come in to help my nan in the mornings and in the evenings. In the first eight weeks of care and support, we had 15 different carers visit my nan's house. We had a constant revolving door of new face after new face after new face. Now I'm a Sheffield lad, my nan was from Sheffield as well. I always say she had a northern sense of humour about this. She used to say she only knew she was getting care when the blue tabard showed up. She didn't know the people, because the people were changing every day. She recognised the uniform. The uniform had become a proxy for the relationship with care. Now the times of my nan's visits were also being moved. They were being moved without any authority, and a carer not attending a visit ultimately led to my nan's fall. I didn't blame the carers. I could see that the problem was the organization's staff turnover. Now when I started my company, I did an awful lot of research on the care sector. I looked at close to 50 organizations in corporate home care, franchised home care, independent care businesses, extra care facilities, residential care facilities, live-in care providers. Something struck me as odd. If they have a mission statement at all, all of them had a mission focused on clients and care delivery. They wanted to be an outstanding care provider. They wanted to be the care provider of choice. Nobody had a people-focused mission statement. In a moment of clarity, I had a big idea. Putting carers first, or as I named it, being carer-centric. I'm becoming increasingly proud to say in summer 2017, I think I was the first person on the planet to use the words carer-centric. So what does it mean? It means putting carers first. It means as an organisation, making carers even more important to the client receiving care. It means genuine compassion for the most important people in the sector, caregivers, those providing care. What would happen if carers were paid more? How would carers feel if they were offered a proper contract, not a zero hours contract? In an industry where driving is an essential part of the role, would carers be happier if they were paid for their drive time? 
So yes, being carer-centric is all about in-work benefits and proper contracts, but it's more than that. It's about defining a culture of support for carers. It's about love for carers. It's about treating carers like family. We started a values-based business. We made family our first brand value. We treat our carers like family. The role we fulfill is to allow a carer to become part of a client's family as a replacement for the son or daughter who's not able to provide that care for mom and dad. Now, as we grew, there was a challenge. We were the oddballs. Being carer-centric was unique. The research had told me that. So, when we added people to the organisation, we were recruiting people with experience, but that experience was not necessarily useful. We risked recruiting somebody who wasn't carer-centric. Yes, everybody was carer-centric to my face, but when they got into the role, they were potentially a detractor from our vision and values. They slipped into learned behaviours, established ways of working that can happen in stress situations. And trust me, care gives lots of potential for stress situations. And I call that reflex-like response muscle memory. It's experience working without conscious thought. Because we were unusual, the people's experience wasn't useful. Their experience, working without conscious thought, was not helping them, and it wasn't helping us. So what did we do about that? We got the team together. All of our training is values-based, and as a result of that, it's not unusual for us to start a training session with a discussion about vision and values. So we got the team together, we gave everybody a sheet of flip chart paper and a pen. And I said, draw me the organisational chart for this company. And they will put me at the top, predictably. Some would say dutifully. And they all put the carers at the bottom. And they placed themselves in the middle order as supervisors, coordinators, registered care manager and admins. They placed themselves either higher or lower in that middle order, dependent on a perceived importance in the organisation. I thank them. And then I said, but you're all wrong. The good news, though, is you're all wrong for exactly the same reason. Please take that piece of paper and rotate it. Stick it to the wall. Let's talk about it. Everyone had created a traditional hierarchical organisational pyramid. When we rotated it, I believed it better represented what we stood for as an organisation. That inverted pyramid has carers at the top. Carers are absolutely the most important people in the organisation. They need to be shown at the top of that pyramid. I was the least important person in the room. The guy that started the company wasn't that important anymore. The larger we've become, the less important I become every single day. I had no problem at all with me being at the bottom. Carers were very happy to be shown at the top. The problems came in the middle order. When we discussed this, a 20-year veteran of the care industry said to me, are you saying to me that the carers are more important than me and my experience and my qualifications? And I said, yes. Because without the carers, your experience and your qualifications do not deliver care. But the good news for you is you're more important than me. Because everyone's more important than me. As we've grown, my belief in that big idea has become less important. I don't believe it less, but the less important I've become, the more important it is that others in the organisation own that belief, that they add their own flavour to it, that they define their own standard of being carer-centric. There's another way to think of that inverted organisational chart. I'm at the bottom, supporting everything above. My strength in our values and our vision needs to be stronger than everybody else's because I need to inspire them. But I'm only directly responsible for the person directly above me in the pyramid. If I choose to love a carer directly, I risk invalidating the manager in the middle. My role is to inspire them to love their team more. 
Now, when you work that way, everyone in the organisation takes some degree of ownership for the vision of being carer-centric. And some wonderful carer-centric magic happens. Carers actually thank carers. It's possible for a carer working a double-handed evening shift, working alongside a colleague, to be so impressed by the work that her colleague has done that she can ring the office and ask one of my admins to send a thank you card to that carer. Carers thanking their fellow carers. Carers loving carers. Carers also being carer centric. Now I started my life being cared for by my nan. I don't know whether lower staff turnover would have saved my nan, but it has to have helped. I'm absolutely sure that if carers felt more compassion, all of you that stood at the beginning and hadn't yet had a conversation about care will find it easier to find the compassionate care that you need. According to Industry Body Skills for Care, we currently have 152,000 vacancies in adult social care. That's over 150,000 empty jobs for the demand that exists today. We've got an ageing population. People are living longer with increasingly complex conditions, which means the job of being a carer is getting more complicated. In addition to that, we've got more elderly people in society. The baby boomer generation, the population explosion of the 40s and the 50s, that cohort, are starting to come to a point where they need care. It's a population bubble. It means the generation following it, my generation, is smaller. There are fewer sons and daughters to support the large numbers of mums and dads that are going to need care over the course of the next few years. If carers felt more love, maybe more people would be prepared to be a carer. If more organisations were carer-centric, maybe some of those who work in care, who are choosing to leave, could be persuaded to stay. I work in a sector where care for clients is written into law. The 2014 Care Act is very clear, has within it the concepts of dignity, choice, maintaining independence, the requirement on me as a care provider to write a person-centred care plan for everybody that we provide care to. There is legislation ensuring compassion for those who are receiving care. If as a society we don't also care for those providing care, who else will?